The psychedelic revolution is here. If you want to integrate your visionary experiences into your purpose, get clear on your entrepreneurial path and help people while you do what you love, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to The Psychedelic Entrepreneur, medicine for these times. I'm your host, Beth Weinstein. I'm a spiritual business coach, three-time entrepreneur, and a lifelong student of psychedelics and sacred plant medicines. You carry your own unique medicine, and your medicine is what we need for these times. This podcast will help you to share your medicine so you can create transformation in the world. Listen in on conversations with psychedelic leaders, change makers, and conscious entrepreneurs who are living proof that a better world is possible when you follow your heart and live in alignment with your soul. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm here at Akira Retreat Center, um, which happens to be near my house and happens to be where my friends are after the Horizons Conference. And we are here with the leaders of the Global Psychedelic Society, GPS. And I would love it if you guys could introduce yourselves and just say a little bit. All right, take it from there. Um, I'm Marisa Sturtz. I'm a filmmaker, storyteller, uh, been involved in community organizing since 2016, 17. Uh, and um, one of the stewards, co stewards of the Global Psychedelic Society, focusing on community, or er, focusing on communication and strategy. All right. Uh, yeah. And I'm. Mike Margulies, uh, uh, also a coaster on um, the GPS, um, been working in psychedelic education and community building since you know, 2015. Got my start in Baltimore, organizing local community and monthly events with speakers. And um, that community eventually evolved into what's today, the Baltimore Psychedelic Society. And I've worked under various other projects and banners over the years um that brushed us uh psychedelic seminars that that in turn grew and uh but in recent years my attention's been on this gps network which i've been working on for many years kind of quietly and then as as other folks got involved it really has ramped up in the last couple years and it's been really cool great thanks yeah hi um i'm jazz um, <clears throat> Jazz Kadash. I am a cultural and medical anthropologist. Um, I've been getting involved in the psychedelic space since uh, 2016, and um, yeah, as an anthropologist, I kind of just take a look at all aspects of the ways in which North America is currently adopting psychedelics into our modern day culture, medicine, and policy. So uh, I've worked in community organizing, and I have also worked in uh, writing ballot initiatives. I've worked in tech software for psychedelics, and I've also worked in developing protocols for psychedelic therapists. I train um, psychedelic facilitators, uh, but truly the heart of my work lies in the work that I get to do with the Global Psychedelic Society it just brings me so much joy to be able to do that work. Um, and yeah, it's it's an honor. You know? Thank you. Mm-hmm. So who wants to introduce the Global Psychedelic Society and tell the listeners what it is, what the intention of it is, what it's about, and, um, you know, where is it going? What's the mission? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. 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 Um, <clears throat> so, uh, for any listeners out there who are not so familiar, um, psychedelic societies are community-led organizations dedicated to educating, harm reduction, and and community building around psychedelics. Uh, they've popped up on their own uh, all around the world since 2010, and uh, there's over 300 now around the world and up until i think 2016 nobody <clears throat> they weren't necessarily as connected to each other um but slowly with beyond psychedelics 
and it was the Beyond Psychedelics Conference in Prague in 2016, where there was the first gathering of leaders. And then 2018 at Boomfest, we got together, brought a bunch of leaders together. COVID hit, jazz came on board, started leading um, bi-monthly meetings of these leaders. Um, and and it really started to pick up speed, especially with uh, Denver's PsychSci 23, when we brought so many leaders together to share resources on what does it mean to to have a thriving psychedelic society? How what are the different models and things that different leaders have uh, figured out, and how do we share them with each other instead of reinventing the wheel? And so it really began as a network of leaders, but it has since also expanded into. Um, sort of the mycelial connective tissue and we see there being a real need to help newcomers on their psychedelic journey discover the first touch point to psychedelics through community through these psychedelic societies there's a lot of resources that are being developed in the greater community uh, in the psychedelic space Um, and and the psychedelic societies are an amazing way to get that out to the people on the streets and and help connect all the dots in the space Anything I I guys want to add? Yeah, I think I would add, you know, seeing how the movement is accelerating and moving in all these really brilliant and beautiful directions, uh, having community as the cornerstone or the bedrock of this movement is increasingly becoming more and more important in order to ensure a sustainable future. You know, we can change medical uh, research, we could change policy, but really at the root of all of our human uh, interaction uh, and the systems that we're part of and building is uh, the culture and community that we're, that we're building. So with the psychedelic societies, what we get to do is really disseminate um, the educational pieces around harm reduction, education, and how to safely use uh, psychedelics and, and various substances amidst the paradigm shift of medicine changing and policy changing. So it's really that. I see it as this third prong um, to really shifting a paradigm. Nice. Like, on that? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think Ari and Jobs have done a good job of sharing the important pieces. And, and we have there's a lot of different ways that this vision, this mission like manifests. Um, and so we bring the leaders of these groups together. Um, there's bi-weekly meetings uh, that happen on zoom and then also in person ones, like that we, you know, Marisa mentioned that it's like about science, but also at horizons. Um, and we have this big public facing um, kind of after party decompression, uh, the Sunday after horizons, but also, before things up into the public, we had a moment where it was just for the psychedelic society leaders. And so things like that are, these are really important, I think, to what we're doing is providing these opportunities for these leaders who otherwise would be operating separately to like not have to reinvent wheels and sharing information and resources. And then, and increasingly also um, generating resources for them, like this uh, starter care resource kit that Jazz has been working on. And um, we have a yeah, it's a free resource out there. It's a work in progress still that we're looking to complete um, and other projects too in the works. Like we want to create this mentorship program for new groups that want to start. Um, and so, there, and there's a whole number of other things that could list out. We have a tour circuit also. Um, currently, like comedian Shane Moss is um, on tour and at each of his stops, we connect him to the local community. And so they tell their people like, hey, this is like a comedian in town, but also people coming for Shane can find the local community. So creating those kinds of connections. Um, so there's just some examples of some of the pro- some of the many projects that we're doing uh, through the GPS. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. So um, I'm curious, for, for someone who hasn't been to a psychedelic society meeting or, or meet up, whether that's online or in person, in a local committee, what would you say happens generally? And I'm sure they're all very different. But what is, you know, the general intention of what goes on in a typical psycho society like Mia? Is it to, because this has actually happened numerous times where I live, 
um, or other <clears throat> meetings where it's a place people want to go and just find drugs. <laughs> yeah. Usually, yeah. Usually that's something that, at least, you know, when I was organizing local community and other ones, usually we want people not to be telling that. Um, there's usually explicit disclaimer saying, hey, this isn't the place to look for drugs. Um, but it is a place to learn. And it is a place to buy community. And so the types of events can vary. So sometimes there might be speakers, um, you know, psychedelic research centers all around. Uh, so when I was organizing in Baltimore, you know, I would have some of the Hopkins researchers give talks. And, mm-hmm. and similarly in San Diego, where I live now, the AWARE Project will have people from UCSD giving talks. Um, so that might be one example. Or another example would be integration circles, where people who want to process their experiences they've had with psychedelics. Uh, and maybe they're close to your dark people that will that with it and come find a community to process their experiences with. And sometimes just social gatherings, you know, bonfires or um, Kaaba nights or something like that, just opportunities to meet people. Um, and actually the best way to understand if you've never been to a psychedelic society meeting is to find your local psychedelic society. Um, much of the other thing that we uh, they do with the GPS is we've been maintaining this resource, this map on our website, where so wherever you are in the world, uh, we provide this easy resource to find your local community, and that's at globalpsychedelic.org. We can just click and find the map. It's funny because over the years, I've had so many people, just strangers out there on the internet, contact me and say, "No one where I live dealt with psychedelic," mm-hmm. and even even still to this day, I think I get that. And I do see tell them to like go go you know to their search engine and look for a local psychedelic society or even like somewhere a few hours away. Um, but let me ask, cause this has been a suggestion I've actually given my clients over the years. And especially in the last you know year, knowing about what you guys are doing. If someone lives in a community, um, for example, where I'm sitting right now, it's like, there's not a huge community around here. I mean, there is, and there's not. How easy is it for someone to start their own psychedelic society? And then what do you say about, there's still fear. You know, like the judgment, I don't want my neighbors knowing. Does this come up for people still? Well, one, there is a Hudson Valley psychedelic. Yeah, it's like, what is that? This is like the other side of Lads and Valley. Because I know no, I'll say um, <laughs> one of the beautiful things about the GPS network is that uh, all the society leaders get to learn from each other. And so many of them are at different stages of developing their psychedelic societies. So, for example, like the UK Psychedelic Society is one of the longest running ones. And they've had some of their systems put in place for longer than the GPS network has even existed. And so even we are learning things from them. And so um, and then some organizations are cert- are certified 501c3 nonprofits. Right. And a lot of the ones that are coming in, especially in this past year, are brand new. And they're like, I don't really know how to get started, right? And so the first most important thing that we offer is a space for these uh, like-minded leaders to come together and learn from one another and exchange resources. Uh, The second level of that, which we started noticing, there's some recurring themes and issues that people run into. So we started to create a resource kit, which Mike alluded to earlier, of kind of the bare bones of how do you start your own community-based organization that is rooted in psychedelics. And it kind of goes over what roles do you need to consider? Uh, What are the pros and cons of being a nonprofit? How do you open a bank account? Like maybe don't put psychedelic in your name when you're opening a bank account and all these kinds of things like that. Um, What kinds of events to host? What frequency um, should you be hosting events and things like that? So we're actually currently fundraising to really develop this resource kit. Um, And right now we have the bare bones up online, but it's really just just the early stage. And so many people have shared uh, how much that has been supportive to them already. One of the big things for sure is this piece of stigma, uh, our piece on stigma. And I think, you know, what we've learned from our leaders in places like Thailand and Ukraine, you know, it's funny, like when we say global, like people don't really like think global, like we're so stuck in the U.S. So frequently and um, is that they're often saying, you know, we get to learn from you guys in the U.S., 
And But it wasn't that long ago where we were leading our own societies and there was stigma. But because we kind of just kept pushing, stigma started slowly to shift, right? And the person who started uh, psychedelic societies back in 2010, his name was Daniel Jabor, and uh, we lost him uh, years ago. Uh, he said, come out of the psychedelic closet, right? And so it's that invitation and that when you start hosting these kinds of events and showing, like, look at the value of psychedelics, you're really coming out of this closet uh, of educating people on what these can be instead of just the, the typical ster- or stereotypical ideas that people have of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to piggyback off that. I think that's a lot of the point. Is, and like, Daniel Jabor's uh, words around coming out of a psychedelic closet were very influential on me. I, I think I must have listened to that. It's a recording of a talk he gave at Burning Man um, before he passed, and it's on the Psychedelic Salon podcast, and I was, must have been listening to it um, when I was in, like, Southeast Asia um, on a sabbatical. Um, and, you know, by the time I came back home and decided to start organizing this in this field, um, that was a big part of the reason, you know. So so your point, like, yeah, some people might be uncomfortable and not everyone can come out of the psychedelic closet and that's okay, but some of us can do it. And those of us who can and who feel safe, um, the more of us that do it, the easier it becomes for other people to do it. And that was certainly what I started. Um, you know, when I started psychedelic seminars in Baltimore nine years ago, um, it was very explicitly like, okay, I want to, it's like a be the change you want to see in the world. I want to live in a world where we can be open and honest about psychedelics. Um, and so I need to start being open and honest about psychedelics. And so I, and and it was Baltimore 2015. It was a lot even riskier than today, you know, I, and people thought I was crazy, like going, what do you mean you're making public events about psychedelic drugs? Um, but um, it was important to me. And 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 now I look around like, wow, okay, well, it seems to be working because now there's so many groups like this and there is a conversation happening. Um, so I think, yeah, breaking that exact um, taboo is kind of the point. And. Um. Fascinating. And you mentioned Ukraine and Thailand, and I know there's one in India. Where else? Are there any surprising places? Yeah, like yeah. popping up in North Korea yet? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the India one isn't, uh, as far as I know, there isn't an active society in India currently. There was one, but the person who was running that thing, she kind of pivoted to like something slightly different than, you know, when we think about psychedelic societies, is it that particular kind of organization that's holding regularly occurring yeah. monthly events? She's still involved in like psychedelic space, but in kind of a different way. Yeah. But like, there's, um, yeah, there, Taiwan was done when I was talking to Ta- from Taiwan the other day. They're just starting. Um, I don't even think they've made a, like a public facing entity yet, but um, I was just speaking with this person. And there's, and there's, Definitely political sensitivity uh, in some places. We're also starting to connect with uh, organizations in Russia. Um, right now, they're not on our map, but in building relationships with people there. We also have the Arab Psychedelic Society, uh, which has really been popping up. We have the Farsi Psychedelic Society, uh, which is led by Parham, who is also on the TPS team. And, you know, when he comes from Iran, and it's, and luckily, you know, he lives in the Bay Area right now, but. In places like Iran, you can't really have these kinds of conversations there. So it's really quite crumbling for us yeah. to have these leaders from all around. And of course, like all around Europe, we have we have a ton in, in Northern Europe, like France and Berlin and Germany, um, Switzerland, and um, in also in South America, Ecuador, Mexico, Austin, yeah, Peru. And then, like, yeah, and then another interesting case, too, is, like, the Singapore Psychedelic Society. I ask about Singapore. Yeah, there's a Singapore Psychedelic Society, but in Singapore, uh, as I was understanding it, um, you know, it's not even legal if you're a citizen of Singapore to do psychedelics in another country where it's legal. So you can be prosecuted if you come back to Singapore, right? And so what they're working on at the, in the Singapore Psychedelic Society is just basics, like, changing the laws so that you can at least do psychedelics safely in place in other places that are not Singapore where it is legal. Right. So people are starting from way different points, but to your point earlier, like people can learn from, um, 
existing groups. And that's part of what we're doing is um, trying to provide that. I want to ask, um, so it's three of you as the leadership team. I know there's been others involved. So this is, is this officially a nonprofit organization? Is this a 501c3? Is this something you want to monetize? Like, what do you, I mean, of course, you're, it's a passion project. You want to help people. I think it really is important, this work. But then we all know, got to pay the bills, got to survive. So, yeah, what is the model right now? And how is this um, running? Uh, currently, so we're an LLC with a fiscal, a 501c3 fiscal sponsor. So uh, that means it's, in a sense, we're kind of um, a hybrid organization. So uh, we can accept tax deductible donations through our fiscal sponsor, the Lumina Foundation. Um, so we can operate as a nonprofit in that way un- under that fiscal sponsorship. But we also, um, we're operating uh, through an LLC. So um, we also have the ability to do things that are not strictly under that context too. Um, and we're figuring out our model. You know, we, we're trying all the routes. We haven't figured out how to make a living doing this yet. Um, so this has been volunteer yeah, led yeah. Um, so far. Yeah, we have received sponsors. You know, this last event we did, though, we received we did receive sponsorships from Dr. Bronner's and Maps and others, and um, you know, Lumina Foundation themselves and Oren Fund, and we had ticket sales. And so there's, uh, you know, so we have revenue coming in, although most of that got spent on things like the venue and effort that after all the expenses of an event, um, you know, really. Uh, you're not like raking in the dough exactly when it's all said and done. Um, but we are pursuing different routes. So uh, we are pursuing the philanthropic route because we have a fiscal sponsor. So if there, um, if there are philanthropists out there that like what we're yes. talking about and want to so bring it up, then yeah, for now. we are, yeah. we'll love to talk to you. Um, and we can accept tax deductible donations. Uh, we're also long-term though. We don't necessarily want to be, reliant on philanthropy so we're also want to develop our own business models of sustainability um and we're figuring out what that looks like but there's a tension there between sustainability and access so we thought about like for example like it doesn't cost anything for a psychedelic society to be part of the gps network mm-hmm. we have thought about the idea of like a membership but then I wouldn't want to turn anyone away for the lack of funds a lot of these leaders are the volunteers themselves but there could be a middle way Right, where there's a price, but like we don't, but this is what we did for our vet, for example. This week, this weekend, there was a price and there were different tiers they put shoes into at sliding scale. And on top of that, there was no one turned away. So, literally, I mean, I had an email address, you know, scholarships at globalpsychedelic.org. And every single person who emailed us saying, Hey, I can't afford the ticket, we said, Cool, we're going to give you what, what can you pay? You know, we let everyone pay whatever they wanted to ultimately. Yeah. So, there's, we're experimenting with those kind of economic models too. Yeah, and I, I would say uh, it's really important to us uh, to move small. Uh, I've seen just so many organizations in the psychedelic space moving quite fast and, you know, developing their models and then it just kind of disappears. And if we, we really want this organization to outlive us, you know, we want one of the core tenants is, um, is uh, pen regenerative Regenerative. steroid? Yeah, okay, I'll just repeat that. (laughs) Uh, One of our core tenets is regenerative stewardship, and the idea is that it lasts for generations. And for that purpose, we are moving very slow, and we really take our roles as stewards as something really um, powerful uh, and important. And it's not just like, oh, we're co-founders, right? So therefore, we should be making money. It's more like, okay, well, we're stewarding this organization to li- to live uh, sustainably. And so with that, uh, that's why just kind of operating as this like LLC right now is what like step one looks like in order for us to really develop our like... Um, our bylaws right and so in the meantime what we've been doing is really setting up our a uh, very decentralized form of uh structuring our organization which allows for a decentralized decision-making power to occur 
And if we were to just like become a 501c3, then we would have to be jumping through so many other bureaucratic hoops that would not really necessarily be so conducive to being a decentralized organization. So we've moved really slow right. with that piece. One other component, and then I'll hand it over to you after this. Yeah. It is um, by being an LLC, we get to have revenue streams. Mm-hmm. And so currently with our tour circuit project that Reese is leading with our uh, with Lyndon, who's on our team, uh, we we allow for space for an actual revenue model so that we're not completely reliant on um, so to best as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um well and to add to that Rebecca can whip hand it to you too. Um yeah, like we but being a 501, the, re- the reason we haven't made a 501 state, there's several. Um, and yeah, it, it restricts in ways like what sort of things you can do, but also to, to add to what you're saying about the governance, you know, if you're a 501 C3, you are a corporation mm-hmm. and you have a mandated type of structure. You must have a board. You must have, there's like certain roles you must have uh, and it's mandated. And part of what we are doing is actually creating different types of governance structures and there's ways there's ways you can with a valuable one c3 still do it like if you make a 501c3 and then the board votes essentially votes away its own power into a different structure there's kind of ways you can finagle it um but we're trying to um yeah you, it, it's more difficult in a lot of ways um and part of what we are innovating on is the governance structure itself uh, of how we're running a more decentralized non-corporate kind of organization right there's a couple of places that to take that i mean <laughs> which one do i take um i mean the regenerative stewardship like um, and and the the model of governance that we're talking about is called teal mm-hmm. uh which is ken wilbur uh, philosophy of organization where and as said it's shared um, building we come over that building on his book yeah. who wrote the book reorganized uh frederick yeah. lulu wrote the book reinventing organizations yeah. and it draws up both um ken wilber's work ken wilber wrote the foreword to it but um it's drawing from a number of people including ken wilber but frederick lulu and yeah, ken wilber came up with a system to to organize different power structures and he does it by color and teal is the one we're currently at um it's this evolution of instead of top-down and hierarchical power structures, CEO, regular C-suite running the show. Instead, we have decided and divided decision-making powers by circles of, of spheres of like, okay, so I run the, um, I'm, I'm, I'm the technical lead of the tour circuit. Um, so I am the decision-maker and I work with the team and Lyndon is actually also running a lot of it with me. Um, but when you are the decision maker, you don't have to. Um, you you will, you can get advice from people below you, like people that will be affected by your decision, not below you, because you're not real up and book. But people who will be affected, and then people who might be a little more experienced in that in that realm, and then that gets incorporated, and we have one big circle of all the decision makers, and then together we share what's going on, so that we can operate as a, a, a an organism that is you know, like informing each other. And it's like a school of fish or a flock of birds. No, no bird is saying, Hey guys, let's go left here. We are sensing what's alive. And, you know, as an idea comes up, we share it and we all, we go over it, but it's not as, it's not consensus. It is, it is much more like we are each empowered to make a decision in our sphere of um, excellence or or, our expertise. And it makes for a really much more like a live way of making decisions where people are empowered to be their whole self and operate in, in what brings them joy as opposed to um, more t- typical structures. Yeah, one, one piece that Anya, uh, who ran in the UK segregated site, I think for a long time through Teal, uh, shared with us is, if you have to vote, then you fail. Um, because uh, if you're voting, it means you're not actually value aligned. And you need to, and, and the whole goal is to make sure that everybody on the team is value aligned. And I should be able to, if I have an idea that I know is aligned with the with the organization mission and value, then everybody should be able to see the, the value of that idea. And so if there's like, oh, there's a divide in what we should do, then then we have lost like the, that core kind of piece that brings us all together on. Uh, 
shared mission. Yeah, it's tough to say <laughs> no. on, on Teal. Um, and um, I have done almost entire podcasts on this before. Um, but um, actually, I did one recently on Psyched Up today. So if you want to go even deeper, but I guess I would also just add and brief around the, how the decisions are made. Um, yeah, so it's not hierarchical, right? Things, decisions don't get kicked up a chain, but yeah, not democratic either. Um, usually, essentially, everyone in the organization makes decisions. And, um, and yeah, it's during this advice process that Marisa was speaking of, you get advice from other people in the organization, but the generally it's like the person who's closest to the decision, whoever's closest to the project is making, as opposed to like in traditional organizations, you can kick up a chain to the managers, but it doesn't, decisions don't go up a hierarchical chain in this way. Um, they stay closest to the ground level of where, of the person making the decision. Um, and things that resembled um, where their managers and other structures become more like in the structure of a coach, for example. Mm-hmm. What makes this so exciting is like this work we're doing on being sort of the connective mycelial tissue between so many different parts of the psychedelic ecosystem. Um, what makes this so exciting is that it's probably the only way we could ever do something so ambitious because being the connective mycelial tissue that takes the resources that are being developed by Zenno, by Dance Safe, by um, education, and just like all these different orgs that are providing awesome stuff and getting them down out to the people. Uh, like no, no C-suite should be deciding how that's done. That should be just done collectively in a community or um, RAM organization. This is amazing. And I'm curious, how has it been received by, I, I assume, then you partner with these other organizations? Like the whole psychedelic ecosystem, the, have you been, has it been received well so far by everybody? Or are there some players that are like, nah, I don't want to help out. I don't want to get involved because I'm busy doing my own thing. I mean, I'm curious. Like, And that's where the value aligned conversation, I guess, comes in. But well, It's yeah. not about external kind of organizations yeah. adopting our model. Um, it's more just the way that we make decisions internally. You know, and, and so far... Yeah, you know, like the collaborations between other organizations, that kind of happens. Like there's usually like one main point person of, that's kind of like leading that. But um, it's not that the other organizations need to adopt that. Yeah. More. But so far they've but been pretty well. favorable, you know. It, it, yeah, it feels very encouraging. And I think a lot of, you know, just like us, it's a bootstrap um, space right now. And then like... So these things need to move with the speed of trust, as so many people in our space say. It's just taking time. And we have really only, you know, we're still in that process of kind of putting on our own oxygen mask. And um, we're developing these things. And as they become ripe, I think there's a place to be like, oh, you have awesome harm reduction materials. How can we help get them to a place where we can share them with our society leaders? You know, these are things that, like, would be fun, would be great and in service, I think. Um, and and then this just built with the relationship in this time that unfolds. Amazing. Anybody um, want to add before I ask the next question? No, good. Okay. Um, so what I'm wondering is if someone wants to start one up, a, a psychedelic society, um, but, you know, they're putting on their own oxygen mask themselves. Like, it's it's a labor of love. Um, but what, do you, what do you say to them that about maybe the time and energy and even resources that go into it. So for example, where I live, the psychedelic society meets at people's homes. Um, but what if someone lives somewhere where it's like they don't have that or they don't have a place to meet or, um, you know, they don't even know how to start getting the word out? You know, do you help them with even like these little startup pieces of like how to make it happen and also with let's say no resources, like completely free, you know, other than their time and energy. Is this? Yeah. I mean, we have the resource kit, yeah. which, you know, is still a work in progress. And, um, we have a mentorship program, uh, well, an idea of develop that we haven't developed yet, but, mm-hmm. um, that is one of the projects that is high on, on the list to really get going is, it's more of a hands-on that would supplement the resource kit that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm showing, you know, and it would, there's a few different forms of it. We played with like you pairing people up with societies that exist, bringing on cohorts of 
new societies together so they can also learn from each other. Um, and yeah, this, uh, this one, it should be coming, uh, a, at least a first pass at it. it should be coming pretty soon. We hope, um, and, um, but yeah, and that's, that's the idea of the resource kit and this upcoming mentorship program. I'll add, you know, once they have a website, or what, do, what is the minimum they need to be listed on our... Yeah, does this I mean, lighting? we basically, uh, yeah, when new societies are starting, uh, we basically want them to ha- actually just have started organizing events. And usually it means like some of them, there's a few that aren't public facing. The majority of them do have some sort of either website or or at least like an Instagram or Meetup or Facebook page or some presence where people can find their events. Um, there's a couple exceptions where people are, are more of like an under-the-radar network. But um, once someone has actually started organizing the events, then we bring them onto the network uh, and they can join our calls and they can be on the map. Um, we usually don't bring people on, though, that are saying that are um, saying like, oh, I want to start. Yeah. It's not people that say like they want. They want you to actually like make that first step of like actually bringing something concrete in. And but soon those people that are saying I want to start. I need I need help with that first step too. Well, how they have that piece in place too, which is what those donations will go to. And that's right. Yeah. One, of our, one of our first points we really want to develop. But it, what happens is if you get people too new and to our like meetings, then it's it makes it really hard for right. yeah. the more experienced society. So. But yeah. it is a high point that we really want to prioritize. Yeah, that would be a new program I to develop. That. Um, yeah, so put in the basic effort. It's yeah. not, it can't be too hard, but you just, yeah, you have a thing on Meetup. Yeah, and start meeting up. And if you build it, say, like, on day. Yeah. yeah. One thing that's also really valuable to Nate here is, like, I don't know what the assembles psychedelic society might need. <laughs> You know, I grew up in Canada and Montreal, and um, I can get an idea of what society is in North America might need. But it, it can't, it's not on us to, like, how do we know what person would be really good to lead the, the society in, you know, Turkey or in Greece, right? And so that's why it's really important for them to take that first step, because it's so important to have a group of people that you can rely on in terms of a group of leaders to push the thing and make it go. But I don't know those people, right? And so um, there's a really delicate balance between giving guidance and resources on here's how you could start an organization and then also providing space for local leaders to know what's best for their community. And, um, yeah, and so like societies, the individual ones, they aren't chapters of the GPS. Yeah. Every psychedelic society is its own independent entity, and GPS is this network connecting for sharing. But, you know, as Jazz is saying, like, every person knows what's best for their place. So we could tell you, like, and we can show you, well, this is what people can say, this is working for me here. And many societies are doing different things. Some are doing 501c3, some are doing LLC, some are... Uh, doing the, uh, you know one type of that some are doing another some have different legal status of psychedelics or cultural status in other places and so everyone in their locality has to fit to purpose for their local their local community their local needs so we do prefer that our societies are not actively providing medicine ceremonies no. um it does add an extra layer of mm-hmm. uh you know, liability for us to be placing them on our map. And so there are a lot of organizations and societies out there that do offer ceremony. And it's best when they do that under a different organization name, just so that we can like, because to monitor 300 organizations, making and ensuring that they are providing ethical services and, um, you know, engaging in indigenous, like, uh, benefit honoring and sharing and oh, there's so many components there and that we just said okay we're gonna put that one on the side for now but very soon we're gonna start being in a world where most societies are actually indeed offering yep. ceremony you know the lines are getting blurred i mean some of your retreats and uh, there's some places where there's decrim happening and so that's changing it and there's and there's some like developing community healing frameworks within legal context too so it, the lines are getting blurred but yeah generally what we're looking at though for when we're saying like what's a psychedelic society it's not so you know 
we're not talking about people that are focused on holding medicine circles. It's people that are focused on educational community events, um, not, not really focused on like giving medicine itself. So here I'm giggling into my cell phone ring. How many people go and like lure people at these events? It's, I mean, I, I'm sure it goes on. And yeah, there's, I think there are some, some out there or some people don't. I think a lot of societies out there have these like caveats at all their events saying like, this is not a place to source or distribute medicine. Right. Um, because of that like poaching kind of energy. And, and actually like I've seen, uh, people who are leading integration circles, for example, like uh, if there's a certain incident with uh, one of the people in the circles and then uh, it seems like that person needs extra attention. The person leading like the integration circle might say, hey, you know what? This sounds like something you should like come to me for my personal services for. Right. And it's like. It, there's all, there's so much monitoring that, that needs to be done in those areas that like that's, t- that's a direct conflict of interest yeah. right these are peer support groups and you're sourcing clients from those groups right and so that's why the resource kit is really valuable because if i just started my society this year and i'm fresh to the psychedelic scene and i'm super green and excited i would have no idea that somebody would do such a thing Especially like with our excitement, with what psychedelics are doing for the individual. Like, I think so many people believe in the best in others. And to be able to say, like, this is something we've come across. Like, make sure as you bring on integration circle facilitators, like, to make, to, to develop your, like, clearly set rules. And maybe your society is okay with that. Yeah. That's okay. If you're fine with that, that's not for us to tell you. But we'll just give you that kind of like, heads up of like make sure you have that conversation with your team before you kind of start offering integration circles they could have a million of my jaw dropped i'm going to tell my clients never to do that because i i would never think that anybody would do that but then now that you named it i'm like i'm sure it goes on all the time if there's one message you want to get out to people uh about psychedelic societies about the gps about like what's you know the vision for the future of the world that you want to see like what is the message that you want people to hear i'll take a stop <laughs> um i i really i've been running around at all the conferences going to all our friends and all these different organizations and being like can i share with you what we're doing so you can hold this vision with us <laughs> like we what is what does the psychedelic future look like? It looks like one where we're all connected to each other, where we all are sharing resources in an efficient way, where no person is falling into the, between the cracks because they didn't know, they didn't have access, there was no accountability. And so, you know, in my mind's eye, I'm like, I hold the vision of a brick and mortar in every city where a person who is new to psychedelics easily can find it. And they come in and there's an office person, like a psychedelic uh, secretary who's like, what are you here for? What are you, what's your interest? And they can go into psychedelics and addiction, psychedelics and expansion and creativity, uh, peer support, you know, like they can find all these different little like offices are on the side of this brick and mortar. So whatever their need is, they can get connected to the best in the space and have access to that so that they are really supported on their journey. That's my my little piece right there. Yeah, you know what? I really love referring to this Buckminster Fuller quote that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you have to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Um, and so it, the thing we want to change is, you know, the drug war or prohibition. Um, we want to make a post-prohibition world, right? So... Um, so we have to make what is the model that makes that obsolete, right? And I think it's absolutely education and community. The post prohibition world has to be rooted in education and community. And all these things and psychedelics are now entering the mainstream, but in a lot of ways the way that psychedelics are coming through has missed something really, really critical here. Um, yeah, you know, we're talking about medical use of psychedelics, and we're talking about psychedelics for DSD, for depression. Um, for addiction um, but it, we're still looking at the problem as though it's like people live in a vacuum right like oh these people that have PTSD 
or addiction or depression, we're going to treat them with the psychedelic. Um, but why are there so many people with trauma and depression and addiction? Right? Like there's underlying systemic issues that require community healing at the root. It's our disconnection, our isolation. We need to reconnect with each other. We, we need to get out of the separation. And, and so community healing is essential. Um, so in order to build the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible as Charles Eisenstein phrases it um, we need that reconnection we need that community healing um, and so consider anyone who's interested in psychedelics and it's like this, this as we you know, said called psychedelic renaissance and all this um, consider that it's not just really about these substances getting out of these substances being medicalized but more deeply it's about systemic change and community healing it's really beautiful clip, beautifully cut, and um, that just there's a reason we all work together, mm-hmm. and it's because we're really alive on those exact things. So, mm-hmm. and mission, <laughs> it's like that box. So, where can people find you, follow you, download things? Do you have an email list, by the way? Do you have an email list? Yeah, Good. sign up. Uh, we have a newsletter that comes out every month or two. Um, Any more. We're trying not to put too many things out there, but we're finding a lot of people want to know what's going on. Um, we also have a place where you can join our community. If you're looking to start your own psychedelic society, you can go to globalpsychedelic.org and you can click on create a society or join our network. Um, and then Find one. Or find one and they volunteer with us. <laughs> and if you want to join, then we'll add you to our, uh, to our Google group and our bi-monthly calls and our signal group where you can connect with other leaders, but you have to be offering some kind of consistent level of community. Um, and then you can find us on Instagram at Global Psychedelic Society. Um, and then for my own self, it would be underscore uh, J-A-Z dot I-E. Uh, for Instagram and have a website, Jazz Kadash and Gmail uh, and uh, jazzkadash.com. Uh, yeah, and my, I guess, my personal uh, website's mikemarbelese.net. Uh, my last name is M A R G O L I E S. I am at Jester of Amazon on Instagram. Yeah. And if you are the person out there who is has the money and wants to give it to us <laughs> to do all these wonderful things. Um, he had us that sustainability piece taken care of so we can not focus on that anymore and focus on all these projects uh, to support the societies on the world. Email me, mm-hmm. uh, mike at globalpsychedelic.org. And you can find me at marisa starts at gmail.com. My website is your story is everything.com. And um, did we say the Global Psychedelic Society Instagram? Mm-hmm. Okay, great. And we'll have all of this in the show notes. And your links, and your personal link. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it get better for donations. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Lane. That's true. And even if you have small amounts of debt, if you're not like the major philanthropist, if you any amount actually would be helpful for us. Yeah, we have a give butter. You can go to gps.fund, and that leads you to our give butter, and you can make a donation of any amount. Uh, actually, one thing we'd love to get more of now would be uh, monthly recurring donations. So you can make a donation of like ten bucks a month. We like to if we get enough people giving ten bucks a month, that really adds up fast. Um, so that would be a great way to support too. Last way to support is yeah, if you want to be a part of this, we really need you. Uh, it takes takes not more. It takes the world, not just a village, to make this a reality. And so this is an invitation. If you feel excited about the work you hear us talking about, there's a million different jobs and we'd be excited to plug you in. Awesome. Same thing. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see the vision. <laughs> yeah. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're feeling inspired, I'd appreciate it if you showed your love with a review. And check out my YouTube channel where you can find the video version of this podcast. You can also head to BethAWeinstein.com to learn more about me and grab my free business growth trainings. Remember, you carry your own unique medicine and your medicine is what we need for these times.